beautiful Stanton, and today I am absolutely delighted to introduce David Schung, and he will talk about an inundation of Bavarians, the Battle of Kings Mountain, the American Revolution, and the origins of Appalachian stereotypes. Um, Dave Schung is professor of history at Juniata College in Huntington, Pennsylvania, and in 2000, the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching and the Council of, for Advancement and Support of Education named him Pennsylvania Professor of the Year. I'm sure that was quite an honor. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm not the best professor at Juniata, let alone the state of Pennsylvania. Well, uh, the Carnegie Foundation well, is nice you, to differ. You can fool some of the people some of the time. Um, he has written Two Worlds in the Tennessee Mountains, exploring the origins of Appalachian stereotypes, and which won the Appalachian Studies Award for Best Original Manuscript. And he also has edited A Mountaineer in Motion, the memoir of Dr. Abram Job, 1817 to 1906. He is currently writing a book on the environmental history of the War of Independence. So, David, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm in central Pennsylvania, but I'm no stranger to this part of Virginia. I uh, first came to uh, the, the Shenandoah Valley um, when I was I, when I spent one summer working as an interpretive park ranger at Shenandoah. And then I've been in this region for uh, history conferences at uh, Virginia Tech, Radford, Emory and Henry. And all of that was work that uh, went into my first book, uh, Two Worlds in the Tennessee Mountains, available at fine bookstores everywhere. Uh, I, I don't think... I don't think so. Uh, it was my uh, fir uh, first attempt at trying to understand how stereotypes of mountaineers uh, developed. So when I say stereotypes of, of the mountain region, do you, are there images that you think people from outside this region have of mountain residents? Like what? Uneducated, illiteracy, right? What, what anything else? Self-sufficient. Self-sufficient, yes. Hard-working. Hard Hard Good musicians. Good musicians. Yeah. Living off the land. Living off the land, knowing every little plant that, can, that is edible, right? Superstitious. Superstitious. All of this sounds pretty positive. Uh, any negative stereotypes? Racist. Racist. Anything else? Bad teeth. Bad teeth. Okay, yeah, maybe that, uh, that ginseng wasn't, uh, wasn't the, uh, nature's toothbrush. Wary of strangers. Wary of strangers. Okay. Okay. When I talk to uh, some of my friends and students, they, they always refer to uh, a couple of families in West Virginia. And they're, they're known for? Feud. Violence. Okay? So there, there are some uh, negative stereotypes you mentioned. Uh, illiteracy, uneducated, uh, but also some... Moonshine. Moonshine, yes. Drinking. Okay? But also some uh, images of, of violence. Okay? Now... Uh, Durette, could you hand out that? Uh, yes, absolutely. Okay, so uh, there is, let's see if this works, um, an imagery uh, embedded in this statement. Uh, it's a lot of words on the screen, and so I'm going to read it to you, but also Durette is handing out a, a printout of, of, the, um, of the quotation in case it's easier for you to, to see it at, you know, at a focal length of uh, 14 inches instead of 20 feet. Gentlemen, unless you wish to be eat up by an inundation of barbarians who have begun by murdering an unarmed son before his aged father and afterwards lopped off his arms. 
and who, by their shocking cruelties and irregularities, give the best proof of their cowardice and want of discipline. I say, if you want to be pinioned, robbed, and murdered, and see your wives and daughters in four days abused by the dregs of mankind, in short, if you wish to deserve to live and bear the name of men, grasp your arms, muskets, in a moment and run to camp. The backwater men have crossed the mountains. McDowell, Hampton, Shelby, and Cleveland are at their head, so you know what you have to depend upon. If you choose to be degraded forever and ever by a set of mongrels, say so at once and let your women turn their backs upon you and look out to re for real men to protect them. Okay. Besides the chest-beating masculinity here in this quotation, I think it's, uh, it's pretty striking some of the imagery that's in here, right? Uh, barbarians, shocking cruelties, cowardice, dregs of mankind, a set of mongrels, and these are the backwater men who cross the mountains, the Appalachian Mountains. Now, this is a historical document. I didn't come up with this, all right? Let it, let it be clear, I, I, I did, uh, I, this isn't uh, creative writing here. And I think we historians uh, need to know something about the document in order to understand its context. So here you have the, the quotation. Is there anything you want to know about this document? Who wrote it? Who wrote it? Okay, anything else? Okay, when was it uh, created? Anything else? Accuracy. 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 Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Back the mountain. Okay, you're, you're, you were here uh, in the, you took the previous, you got, went to the previous lecture. Okay, so the, the author here is Major Patrick Ferguson. Did I mess up? There he is. Okay, um, from the... Uh, uh, a British officer from the 71st Regiment of Foot. When was, the, uh, when was this created? October 1, 1780. And then it was printed in the Virginia Gazette out of Richmond in November. Uh, who's the audience? American settlers on the southern frontier. Okay. And what's the purpose? Okay, why, why uh, uh, make this statement? To gather civilian uh, loyalist support, okay? So I just want to point out that when it comes to uh, some of the stereotypes of people, of the people of Appalachia, we're familiar with some of the terms that are, are used today, especially the negative ones, the violent ones, and we see the roots of some of these descriptions going back to the revolutionary period and to the frontier time of Euro-American settlement. Okay? So let me provide some uh, context to the uh, American Revolution and the War of Independence. Okay? So open hostilities start in New England. Let's see if I can get this right. The purple. Ah! Ah! The purple, ah, okay, in uh, April 1775. British officials had thought that the problems in the Boston area, uh, boycotts, protests, tarring and feathering, tea party, they thought that it was the work of a few troublemakers, okay? So they had a relatively small force in Boston, about 6,000 soldiers, and they approached the problem like a police operation. If we round up the troublemakers, uh, everyone else will settle down. So let's go, let's go get those rabble-rousers. Okay. The first battles in uh, New England, in the Boston area in 1775, they took place at? Lexington and Concord. Lexington and Concord, right? And s followed up not long at later by uh, Bunker Hill, and then there were two 
uh, failed invasions of Canada trying to get Quebec, the capital of Canada. And by the end of 1775, it's pretty clear to British ministers in London, to uh, British generals on the ground here, that this is not just a police action. This is not just a few troublemakers, that it's a, it's a, it's a bigger deal here. And so they uh, evacuate Boston, March 1776, and in June, invaded the region around New York City. Okay. So this turned the War of Independence from the thinking of a police action into a war, a, a more uh, uh, traditional kind of standard kind of war. British forces shot up 30,000 uh, regulars and Hessians, hundreds of naval ships. And they focused on this Middle Atlantic region uh, for the next few years. Do you know, uh, happen to know how it went for those British and Hessian soldiers in New York or in the summer of 1776? Good, bad? They, yeah, may, maybe you're familiar with uh, the Hamilton musical. Uh, um, uh, outgunned, outmanned, uh, you know, they, uh, Washington gets, and the Continental soldiers get kicked out of New York City, kicked out of New York, kicked out of New Jersey, and into Pennsylvania, all in about five and a half months. But, end of uh, uh, December 1776, Washington crosses the Delaware, Christmas night, uh, that surprise attack on Trenton, and then a few days later, a, a big win at Princeton, New Jersey, and the uh, rebellion is still alive. Okay. In 1777, uh, there was a lot of action in Pennsylvania, uh, and uh, probably the best known uh, site in Pennsylvania for the revolution might be Valley Forge. Uh, you know anything about Valley Forge? Yeah, like what? Exactly, exactly, and, and it, it, the winter encampment of 70, 1777 into 78. The other uh, main action of 77 was the Battle of Saratoga, which took place around the, the W in New York. All right, I don't know if I trust myself with this. Ooh, upstate New York, okay? Um, let's see if I get this right. Um, Here's a, here we zoom in on, on, the, uh, on upstate New York. One army coming down from Canada, another part of the army coming east from Lake Ontario. Uh, both defeated uh, the big uh, victory in Saratoga, September and October, 1777. Okay. Now, uh, why was that victory so important? Uh, at one level, uh, uh, General John Burgoyne's force coming down from Canada had uh, almost 6,000 soldiers. And to, for the Continental Army to defeat an uh, 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 army of that size was, uh, was the, the biggest victory up to that time. Okay. The other big effect of Saratoga was Yes, terrific. Uh, the French got word of this uh, victory, and they thought, you know, maybe this little baby United States uh, has a chance, has a chance to stand up to Great Britain, the most powerful uh, military force uh, of the day. And do you know what the relations were like between uh, France and Britain for the previous century? <laughs> Oh, they're NATO pals now, but uh, that was uh, not the case in the late 1600s and all through the 1700s. Uh, at least four major wars in the previous 80 years. And so the French thought, if we support the United States, maybe we can uh, strike a blow against our, our traditional enemy. Okay? Now, if you're uh, Great Britain, 
Why, oh, uh, I, I need to say that uh, France then uh, forms an alliance with the United States. The US's first official ally is France, early in 1778. Now, if you're Britain, why might you be worried about an alliance between uh, France and the United States? Well, they have ships. They have ships. They have a navy. They have a navy that they spent a lot of time rebuilding after the Seven Years' War. Any other worries for Britain? Material. Material. Armaments. Armaments. Uh, almost all of the gunpowder that the Continental Army had came from France or uh, French colonies. Um, money. Uh, the, the French government loaned uh, the United States lots of money, okay? But Great Britain was worried for another reason as well. You see, uh, I, I gotta do this. You see, France is over here. Great Britain is right over there. Uh, why might Great Britain worry now that France is in the war? They're so close. They are, Britain, exactly right. They're worried about an invasion of the home islands. Okay. Also, um, there is no way the United States, with some like uh, uh, refitted whale ships, is going to go uh, attack the home islands. Okay. Those whalers are great sailors, but they are not going to... Uh, 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 land at Plymouth and Bristol. Okay? Also, there are um, uh, British uh, sugar islands here in the West Indies, in the Caribbean, like uh, Barbados, Jamaica, St. Kitts. Um, have any of you been to any of these uh, Caribbean islands? All right, we need a field trip. Uh, um, all right. And they are worried that the French are going to attack those colonies because the French also have uh, sugar colonies in the, in the Caribbean. Okay? And these sugar colonies are so profitable. You know, a cup of Barbados alone at its, you know, in the 1700s was worth more than all the economic output of the, the mainland 13 colonies. Okay? So, with France in the war, with the home islands endangered, with the West Indies endangered, Britain has to rethink its strategy. So it sends a lot of soldiers back to Britain and shifts them to the West Indies, sends a lot of ships back to Britain and to the West Indies. But there's this war going on in the 13 colonies in the, in the United States. So how might Britain carry on the war in the United States, even though they have reduced uh, numbers of redcoats, and they don't want to hire more Hessians? So what might they do? Have the loyalists Right, on the ball. So the, the, the thinking was that there were more loyalists in the South than in New England, a lot of loyalists in, in New York City, but the thinking was there were more loyalists in the South, and that might um, uh, fill the ranks up and then allow redcoats to go to the West Indies and to the, and to the home islands, okay? So this starts the third phase of the war. First phase was in New England, second phase was in the Middle Atlantic, now the third phase, let's move a, a British uh, focus to the south. That way the soldiers that are there and the ships that are there are closer to the West Indies and they, each, each uh, side can reinforce each other. And let's draw upon those, uh, those loyalists. Okay? So then in the south there, um, in... Uh, December 1778, Savannah, uh, British uh, capture Savannah. Spring 1780, uh, Charleston. Uh, August, August 1780, um, 
Camden, South Carolina. Okay? So this is the general context for Major Patrick Ferguson's proclamation that we started with, that you have, that uh, some of you have uh, uh, in, uh, in the printout. Okay? He's a British officer in charge of a purely loyalist force of about 1,200. All, all the people under his command are Americans, okay, and we're, they're going to fight revolutionaries. So civil war in the South. Patrick Ferguson's a British officer. He's in charge. Everyone else is loyalist. He is in western uh, North Carolina fall, late summer and fall of 1780. They, they fought a few small skirmishes and won, and he's feeling uh, pretty confident. So he, he has uh, one, of his, uh, one of the prisoners he's taken, he releases that prisoner and sends him with a message to the rebels in Western North Carolina. Okay? And according to the historian Lyman C. Draper, if they did not, if they, the uh, inhabitants of North Carolina, if they did not desist from their opposition to the British arms, he, Ferguson, would march his army over the mountains, hang their leaders, and lay their country waste with fire and sword. This electrified the revolutionaries. You're going to come here and lay waste and hang us? Uh, we're, we're not going to uh, sit around for this. Okay, so revolutionaries in uh, what's now Western Virginia, Northern North Carolina, Northern South Carolina, East Tennessee, Northern Georgia, they uh, uh, gather up in militia companies and they uh, move first to Sycamore Shoals in what's now Eastern Tennessee. Um, I don't know if you can see Johnson City here, uh, Kingsport, okay, Eastern Tennessee. And then they go uh, through the highest peaks of uh, this, this stretch of the Appalachians, and they meet at Quaker Meadows near what's today Morgantown, North Carolina, okay? Uh, you probably can't see the date there, October 1. That's the date of Ferguson's proclamation. You set of mongrels, you uh, 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 barbarians, if you want to be real men, uh, okay? And then they, uh, they take off after uh, Ferguson and his men and eventually wind up at Kings Mountain, which is just at the border of South Carolina and North Carolina. Here's Spartanburg for, uh, for some of you. Uh, maybe you know that. Okay. <clears throat> they called themselves the Over Mountain Men, uh, not the... Uh, Backwater men, and uh, they the um, they numbered about 1,800. So, uh, the numbers um, are, are a little mushy. Okay. So they caught up with Ferguson on October 7th. Then the uh, it was the Battle of Kings Mountain. Ferguson's men, the Loyalists, uh, occupied the high ground, and uh, the Over Mountain men. Uh, surrounded the, uh, all of that high ground. The overall commander of the Over Mountain Men was uh, William Campbell from Virginia, and he ordered them to move out and, quote, shout like hell and fight like devils. And some historians say the shout like hell is a precursor to the rebel yell that was uh, more famous in the uh, Civil War. So they come up the high ground from all directions, uh, shooting from behind trees, behind rocks. Uh, the loyalists counterattack, drive the over mountain men down, down the high ground. Uh, they don't run, uh, but like uh, some uh, continental soldiers did at Camden, and they regroup and head back up again. Uh, there's close uh, quarters fighting, bayonets, 
uh, that pushes uh, some of the over mountain men down. They, they push back. So it's, it's pretty intense fighting. But uh, after you know, uh, some hours, I should have looked this up uh, before, uh, yesterday, uh, uh, they, set, they, they get the, um, uh, the Tory forces like compressed there. It, like, what am I doing? I got to do this. Uh, up at the, at the top, and then the over mountain men are able to set up a crossfire, and that pretty much uh, wraps things up. Ferguson led a number of charges um, against the attackers, um, had a couple of horses shot out from under him, got on another horse, wanted to uh, uh, lead a charge downhill. He makes it about 20 yards before he's shot at least seven times. Okay. All right, so what are some of the results of the war, of the battle? There you go. A uh, pretty mm -hmm. uh, significant victory for the overmountain men. Okay. Do you have a, qu do you have a question? Yeah. The red jacket yeah. on top of the woods, yeah. and, and kind of, you know, yeah. red flag. Right. Now, Ferguson, being an officer, maybe had a red jacket, but the loyalists, I, I'm not so sure. Regulars, British regulars in the British Army, you know, had red jackets, but these were loyalists, and I, I would have to, I would have to check to see if that were the case. Okay. Yeah. Um, cow, they, they've, uh, militia units as well as Continental Army units were at cow pens. Yeah. Yeah. I I would have to check the chronology. I think cow pens mm -hmm. might be uh, eighty one, but I'll have to check. Yeah. Heck, we all have phones. We can get the answer, you know, before I get to page six. And I'm sure we can get an answer to cow pens. Okay. Uh, that's one result of the battle. Another result is the British commander in the South, the overall commander, Lord Charles Cornwallis, now had lost about one third of his force, the uh, westernmost flank of his force. He was making a move on Charlotte, North Carolina. He gets word of this, and he says, uh, it's too risky. With our reduced numbers, he pulls back to South Carolina. The other result is that uh, Cornwallis and some of the ministers in England have to rethink this Southern strategy. How many loyalists are going to join British forces when they suffer uh, losses like this. Yeah. All right, so that's the, that's the setting for the uh, War of Independence. Let's get back to Ferguson's uh, proclamation about an inundation of barbarians. And Dorette, I, I think some people came in a little late and maybe they could uh, get the handout. Okay, so uh, a few, a three, three months, three months afterwards. Okay, inundation of barbarians, a set of mongrels. So if this is one of the roots to the stereotypes of, mount, of mountain people as being violent, uh, um, uh, barb barbarous, then we have to ask some questions. Okay, first, did people living in the mountains have a common sense of identity? I think you need to have this, this, this image, this understanding of oneself in order to have um, stereotypes. It, you, you couldn't say that everyone in uh, Richmond or Norfolk or DC acts in one way or thinks the same just because of the physical location of where they are. Okay? 
So, uh, there, there are probably different forces that pushed the mountain residents together into a, a sense of community. Maybe there were internal forces. Do you think uh, there might, uh, what might be some of these internal or external forces that might have led to a sense of identity? Survival. Survival. Okay, uh, uh, it's tough living out there. And against the Native Americans too. Okay. In the West Virginia Mountains, Okay. Uh, for this region, it was the Cherokees. Okay. And uh, starting as early as June, July 1776, Cherokees had uh, attacked uh, settlers, white settlers in, in Western North Carolina and uh, surrounding regions. Well, the, um, sometimes they, uh, 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 they were allies of the British. They were not necessarily, and some, some other native groups were allies of the U.S., um, but it wouldn't be fully accurate to call the, those kind of working in concert with the British loyalists because they were really acting on their own um, goals. Uh, and they weren't like loyal to King George. They were like, okay, this working with uh, Cornwallis is gonna help us with our immediate and long-term um, um, uh, objectives, okay? So soon after King's Mountain, Cornwallis, the British commander wrote, and again, I apologize for a big hunk of text, when the numerous and formidable bodies of back mountain men came down to attack Major Ferguson and showed themselves to be our most inveterate enemies, I, Cornwallis, directed Lieutenant Colonel Brown to encourage the Indians to attack the settlements of Watauga, Holstein, Kentuck, and Nolichucky. These are all uh, uh, rivers in eastern Tennessee all of which are new encroachments on Indian territories. The good efforts of this measure have already appeared. A large body of mountaineers marched lately to join the rebels near King's Mountain, but were soon to return to, impose, to oppose the incursions of the Indians. Okay, so uh, defending the home. Okay, there's a lot of dangers out there I mean, that, that's one reason why they were in militia companies uh, to begin with, to, uh, to go to uh, um, Sycamore Shoals and Quaker Meadows was uh, for defense, okay? Uh, there were also uh, physical connections that linked people together, okay? There were perhaps these psychological factors that, that formed the, the sense of identity, but there was this road network that existed. Here's that, that map from before. There were local trails and roads that allowed them to uh, congregate at Sycamore Shoals. There were more regional roads and trails that allowed them to get to Quaker Meadows and then on to uh, Kings Mountain. Okay. So physical factors, psychological factors that connected the mountaineers that arguably helped form a common identity. According to one resident who was interviewed towards the end of his lifetime, he, he said, the men were so often called together that they were like a band of brothers raised in the same family. You might be familiar with the term band of brothers from um, the U.S. military uh, allies in uh, the European theater in World War II. Stephen Ambrose and um, the, uh, the um, uh, multi, multi part uh, documentary. Okay. Another question to think about when considering stereotypes is was this, you know, barbarism, mongrels, was this um, just the way Ferguson described his enemies? Did he see all of his opponents? In, this, in these kinds of terms, and if so, then it would be hard to say he, he called the mountaineers 
or label the mountaineers specifically as mongrels, uh, bar barbarians, and so forth. Okay? It's like if someone wanted to describe all the people in Richmond or Norfolk or DC uh, the same way just because they are urban residents. Okay. So if did Ferguson see all of his opponents this way? If you were historians wanting to answer that question, what might you do? Research. On what? His other writings. His other writings. Okay, terrific. So in 1779, he's in New York, and he describes his opponents as rebels, and he looks down his nose at their fighting ability, uh, but he does not uh, call them uncivilized or inhuman or barbarian. Of course, this is using negative evidence. It's making an argument by something that's not there, but just because something is not there doesn't mean he isn't thinking of it. That said, if you look at his letters 1780 when he's in North Carolina, uh, he increasingly describes his mountain opponents in distinctive terms. And he uses phrases like back mountain men. In one letter, just a couple of days before his big proclamation, uh, he writes to his commander, uh, Charles Cornwallis, there are different arrivals from Nola, Chucky, and Holstein, those river valleys, maintaining, what, DHH5649? So he's writing in code here, okay? And when you look at this document, or the version I saw on microfilm, written above those numbers and letters, in pencil was 800 backwater men and uh, bring 300, okay? So someone decoded the letter, okay? Maybe, some, maybe a, a, a secretary, a clerk in Cornwallis's, on Cornwallis's staff, okay? Of all the documents I've looked at in my career as a historian, this is one of my favorites because it, I believe it shows that Ferguson was thinking about these people in distinctive terms because he could have referred to them in fewer letters by some other term, but he takes the time to look up his code book. What is B? Uh, you know, uh, that's, uh, that's five. Uh, what's, you know, it, it takes work to write this out in code. And so I think he is, he is not describing everyone as uh, barbarous or uncivilized, but he's starting to see this group in distinctive terms. Then for people to hold stereotypes, I think there's also another ingredient to put into the mix. You know, maybe there's an element of truth here in the image. Okay. Might the over-mountain man have been, in some respects, barbarous? Isn't there a, at least a kernel of truth in all, most stereotypes? Are there some New York City cabbies who drive <laughs> recklessly? <laughs> yes, because I have been in one where uh, the, the uh, going in one direction, it's like six lanes, and we're in the left lane, and the cabbie makes a right turn. If Ferguson had survived King's Mountain, he might have pointed to some of the uh, events that, that happened after the battle for examples of savagery and cruelty. After the battle, there are those 700 prisoners. Uh, the, they get marched back to Quaker Meadows. Eventually, they get marched to um, uh, eastern North Carolina near Durham. Okay? But during this march towards Quaker Meadows, uh, according to the loyalist captain uh, Alexander Chesney, remember, they're all loyalists, officers were in the rear and obliged to carry two muskets each, which was my fate 
Although wounded and stripped of my shoes and silver buckles in an inclement season, without a cover or provisions until Monday night, two days, when an ear of Indian corn was served to each. Okay. Denying food to POWs, is that uh, inhumane? Do, would that violate Geneva Conventions today? William Campbell, the Virginian who's in charge, uh, the commander of all the overmountain forces, he even had to issue general orders to bring his own troops under control. Okay. Four days into that march back to Quaker Meadows, he ordered the officers of all ranks in the army are to endeavor to restrain the disorderly manner of the slaughtering and disturbing the prisoners. If it cannot be prevented by moderate measures, such effectual punishment shall be executed upon delinquents as will put a stop to it. Okay. And prisoners weren't the only victims. He goes on to say that he heard the complaints of the inhabitants on account of the inhabitants, the, 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 the people living in the regions through which the, this march was taking place, uh, on account of the plundering parties who issue out from camp and indiscriminately rob both Whig, the term for revolutionaries, and Tory, the term for loyalists, leaving our friends, fellow revolutionaries, I believe in a worse situation than the enemy would have done. The worst comes about a week after the battle, when stories began circulating that certain loyalists had committed atrocities before King's Mountain. A copy of North Carolina law was uh, whipped out. Uh, you need a couple of magistrates. Uh, there were magistrates there in the Overmountain Men easy to find a jury, so there were uh, uh, quick summary trials, 36 found guilty, nine hanged right there before some of the commanders uh, can come in and stop that. Okay. Barbarous, inhumane. Okay. It would be wrong though to say that the over mountain men were exceptionally or uniquely violent uh, in this southern theater of, of the war. Both sides used terrorism, used, uh, 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 acted barbarously against civilians and soldiers. Okay? General Nathaniel Green, who is the commander of Continental Forces in the southern theater, writes at the end of 1780, the spirit of plundering which prevails among the inhabitants add not a little to our difficulties, the army's difficulties. The whole country is in danger of being laid waste by the Whigs and Tories who pursue each other with as much relentless fury as beasts of prey. Almost the definition of inhuman, right? Inhumane, you're not human, you're, you're a beast. Okay? Each side made demands on the civilian population. What do you think Whigs and Tories wanted from civilians? Food, absolutely. Anything else? Clothing. Clothes, absolutely. Horses, mules. Horses, uh, work animals. Yeah. The food could be you know, oxen or cattle or sheep, okay? Imagine you are living in Virginia at this time, in Western North Carolina at this time, what would you do? Right. Would you, okay, give up half of your livestock, all of your livestock? Would you run away? Mm -hmm. Who wants to face Samuel Brown, who earned the nickname Plundering Sam? Right. Or William Cunningham, who was called Bloody Bill. All right. So in November 1781, Cunningham and 300 loyalists attacked revolutionary forces led by two guys, Sam, Joseph Hayes, Sterling Turner. They killed everyone in Hayes' unit and they started to burn the fort 
that Turner's men were in. This is Western South Carolina. When those in the fort were told that um, their lives would be spared, they surrendered. And what happens? The loyalists um, kill them all, and Bloody Bill reportedly swung his sword until he collapsed from exhaustion. At least both the Whigs and the Tories are English settlers. Well, so the Whigs and Tories here refers to really um, their, their allegiance. Well, well, the Whigs would be those supporting independence, supporting the revolutionary movement, and it's a reference to it's a reference to uh, a group of British politicians who wanted to restrain the power of the crown of George III. But um, but uh, I think those over mountain men, since they were revolutionaries. Would, would call themselves Whigs because they, they supported independence. Now, Bloody Bill, yes. not a British commander. Correct. He was, he was a loyalist. Right. So there, the, the part that you would call a civil war yes. was more, they were more cruel to each other than the army. Well, the, um, the army did its share of what we would call war crimes, but uh, um, uh, uh, not taking quarter, not, not a, uh, giving quarter, uh, uh, rape, uh, burning of, of, of non-combatants, property. So soldiers did nasty things, but here are loyalist soldiers not, official, not like commissioned uh, British regulars doing nasty things. Okay. Um, so who would want to stick around to face uh, uh, plundering Sam or bloody Bill? Okay. So frontier inhabitants like, tried to make themselves scarce. Okay. One Continental Army officer wrote, it seems to be the general opinion of those yet at liberty to withdraw themselves to places of safety. Okay. So they are disconnecting themselves from the uh, participants in the, in the war, the perpetrators of the killing and destruction. Now what might this mean for uh, viewpoints of British officers like Ferguson and for the creation of stereotypes? Ferguson sees brutal fighting in the South and calls his opponents barbarians. Okay. He doesn't get much chance to balance that view by seeing examples of people acting differently because civilians are making themselves scarce. All right. They have removed themselves from, um, from view. Okay. So they are, they're being disconnected. So you get something of a paradox. You get direct contact and the absence of direct contact that goes together in the creation of these, these images. And what might all of this mean for us today? For those of you, you know, thank you for, for, for coming, for those of you uh, um, joining from uh, cyber world there. I hope you leave with a better understanding of the American Revolution. We might associate the horrors of war with the modern period with what's going on right now in Ukraine. But the, uh, there was plenty of savagery and uh, brutality in the War of Independence. I hope you have a deeper understanding of the historical uh, context for these Appalachian stereotypes and that we can trace some of them back to the 1700s. And I hope you have a better sense of how these stereotypes can get started and how they can persist when people get disconnected from each other, separated and cut off, one side can get ideas about the other side and not see evidence that would question those ideas. We see all sorts of divisions in society today based on politics or culture or beliefs or 
economic position or whatever. One side says, you are extremists. And that side says, no, you are the uh, crazies. You are the nutcases. Okay? But how often do we actually talk to people on that other side, whatever that other side is, to find out their background, their experiences, their positions? And in, so instead of separating ourselves, let's try to reconnect. Let's try to break down some of those stereotypes that we might have of each other. Thank you for connecting with me tonight, for connecting with each other. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of, out of your busy days. Uh, I hope you have a, uh, safe travels back home, and I hope you have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. That was wonderful. Um, I bet there are lots of questions in this group, um, and we have a few minutes to answer some questions. Okay. So. Yes, sir. As you were talking, what are sort of the British officers who are used to a certain culture, way of life, standard of living in England or across mm. mm. the And they're thrust into Western South North Carolina. So, what part of dress play? I mean, I started mm. thinking of, you know, guys in coons and cats. You know, just kind of different things that they probably had ever experienced. You know, didn't have the savvy of like mm. you know, all of that. Mm. Goes from yeah. What do you yeah. Uh, so, how did British regulars uh, think about the 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 appearance? Yeah. 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 Well. Um, I'm sure it was uh, a surprise. It's, it's hard to identify, it's harder to identify the enemy if they're not dressed in a um, regular, familiar, uh, um, in clo that kind of clothing. But uh, many of the regulars sign up for, for life it's, it's not like uh, uh, a one-year enlistment. Uh, Washington always tried to get Continental soldiers to sign up for the duration of the war, and that was tough. But for the British, you, like uh, these officers, they have to purchase their commission. And uh, so they're in it for life. Uh, the the uh, commander-in-chief at Boston, when uh, the war started, General Thomas Gage was active in the Seven Years' War in the 50s, late 50s and early 60s. And he's in uh, North America from, from 63 on to uh, 1775. So he, so for some soldiers, it's not new. For some soldiers, th they fought Indians who are dressed unfamiliarly. Some soldiers fought Irish, and I don't know enough to speak about Ir the dress of Irish, but in some ways it was a, it was a past, uh, I don't know, Durrett, do you know anything about, um, you know, like uh, 1740s and... Uh, I'm uh, not for sure, but um, I'm going to pitch a visit to our museum, um, because we have new signage. Come up to yes. the thing. We do have new signs out on the individual exhibits, and um, one is on the 1760s exhibit, and there is a drawing of a Virginia rifleman, and that was made by a British um, soldier who came here, and I believe that is from mm. either the Seven Years' War or from the Revolution, and if you've got your typical coon hat and uh, your, your hunting shirt, so, um, we, have, we are lucky that we have some visual evidence from the past as well, so... Um, <laughs> yes? I'll just add to that. Um, basically, you see a lot of backcountry men here in Virginia adopting Indian dress for hunting, and it also then extends to warfare. So wearing a breech clout, leggings, moccasins, and hunting shirts. Um, 
Coonskin hats, though, are not a <laughs> super common thing. But but they're wearing, but they are wearing that that fur, that that sort of thing. So it is it is a different dress than they would have been used to in other locations, and even other colonists in other locations would have seen that as as a different way. And um, I just um, to add one more thing, there is also some. Um, uh, written diaries like the Moravian diaries from the 1740s where they are describing some of the people that they encounter in what they call the back country, what we now call the frontier as well. And they, as Misty just said, <coughs> describe um, uh, certain people wearing um, leather leggings, for example, um, and being very stereotypical about them and their descriptions as well. Right. So, Yes, ma'am. So my question was, is part of it that you know, we see pictures of when the British all line up and shoot their muskets and then the enemies, you know, whoever it is. So now we got guerrilla warfare because the mountain men are going to, you know, be hand combat. So is that part of the barbarian? So it's, is it um, the, a, British added, a, a British thinking that this with lines uh, is the proper way to fight? And if you're not fighting properly, you, you either don't know how to fight properly or you're intentionally breaking the rules. And uh, yeah, I think, that's, I think that's part of it. And it's effective, okay? And that, 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 that gets them mad too. They're supposed to be, like, and this is also with natives. Natives are supposed to be uncivilized or just barely a step a higher than wild beasts. Well, how come they're such great hunters? And we, we, we European colonists aren't so great hunters. How come they can grow corn great and John Smith and, and those Jamestown settlers are starving if, if they're so backward? Oh, it's, it's, it, 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 the evidence isn't fitting with the preconception is part of what's going on. Yes, sir. Would you say that Ethan Allen and his Green Mountain Boys had a lot of similarities in common with the men of the mountains? Mm. Yet one seems to get tired with one set of brushes and the other a little lighter. I mm. mean, any, any reasoning for that? Mm. Uh, mm. What's? Is there, is, in other words, uh, geologically, it's probably the same Appalachian mountain chain. And so that you have folks in North Carolina and Tennessee, and you have folks in Ver in Vermont, is there something about the the topography, the the uh, the, the mountain setting that um, uh, leads that that helps explain behavior? Mm -hmm. Great question. Uh, scholars have have uh, debated that all the time. Are people uh, in islands settings? Do they develop a certain way of thinking and behavior? Do people in cold climates versus tropical? Um, it's, uh, it, uh, I, don't th I think you can find a lot of, um, uh, and, and I don't know if Dorette, you have anything to add there, but you know, the, way, the way geography or environment shapes the development of the culture, that's, that's a long standing uh, um, topic of investigation. Is that what your new book is about? My new book is, uh, at, it's looking at environmental history, what, uh, how do humans shape the environment and, and environment shapes humans. Looking at the war, I'm actually taking an approach what I'm calling military metabolism. Um, our bodies have a metabolism and we need energy to keep the blood pumping and the lungs breathing. Cities have a metabolism. You know, they need water, they gotta get rid of waste. Armed forces have a metabolism. They need food, soldiers need fuel, work animals, the work animals need food. All of that comes from the environment. So how did armed forces and governments uh, get that energy and use it? What effect did it have in the course of the war? What effect did it have on different environments, short-term and long-term, close by and distant? That's the... Stay tuned. And on that uh, note, it is 7 o'clock. Yes. Um, 
I want to be mindful of everyone's yes. time. Um, but it sounds like we might have to have you back when you have finished your book. Right. So um, I would like to thank, first of all, every one of you to be here, to come out. Thank you so much. We have missed you very much. Please come again and see us. Our next lecture is September 27th. Also, thank you everyone who's watching um, online. And of course, the American Frontier Culture Foundation who funded this event and our wonderful speaker, thank you. David. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Safe travels home, folks. Thank you for watching this talk. If you share our passion for early American history and would like to support free programs like this, please consider making a donation to the American Frontier Culture Foundation at frontierculturefoundation.org. Thank you for your support, and we hope to see you in person at the Frontier Culture Museum in Stanton, Virginia.